Okay, I'm on my own tonight. Uh, Ashley has abandoned me. Uh, but we are going to do part seven of our uh, Ruth Bible study tonight. Uh, I studied part seven. Part six, we, we got through. We finished uh, chapter three. Uh, so part seven, we're going to um, pick up here. Uh, and start with the first verse of chapter four. And as I studied and went, we're just we're going to go through chapter four tonight. Uh, so we will actually finish out Ruth tonight. But um, I'm just going to get into it, uh, read, share <clears throat> my notes, my thoughts. Um, but we are in Ruth chapter four, and we're going to start with the first verse. Um, and we're getting down to the end here. We're getting to the part. We've seen uh, Ruth follow Naomi. We've seen Ruth follow Naomi's uh, uh, suggestions, and, and we've seen Ruth work in Boaz's field. We've seen Boaz provide that protection uh, that Ruth was looking for. Now we're to the part where Boaz is doing things the right way. Boaz is going out um, to present the case before the nearest kinsman. Um, and, you know, he said if the nearest kinsman won't perform the duty <clears throat> to uh, Ruth, he will. So that's where we're at now. So we're going to pick up in Ruth chapter 4, verse 1. I'm going to read the first two verses and then um, go over some of this. It says, um, Then went Boaz up to the gate and set him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, Ho, such a one. Turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. So what we're at now is we're at the gate of the city, uh, which was like an outdoor court where the men would go over uh, important issues. They would discuss news. They would settle disputes, all these types of things. Um, and it kind of, it's, it's weird. This is what we were watching in there in the living room before uh, come in here uh, and the, the Andy Griffith show. I picture the gate of the city being kind of like Floyd the Barber, uh, his shop. It's where all the men gathered. It's where they talked. It's where they went over maybe what's going on in the city, um, discussed issues, came to agreements. <clears throat> but anyway, here we find uh, Boaz confronts the nearer kinsman. Remember, he told Ruth he was a kinsman, but there was one nearer than he was, uh, and that he, you know, was going to do things the right way, give that person the opportunity uh, to redeem what was Naomi's, and to redeem Ruth, and to bring up um, a child. All these things, and he said, you know, if he won't do it, I will. Uh, so Boaz confronts the nearer kinsman, and, and one thing I found interesting is the fact that he calls him such a one. Uh, to me, it was just interesting that, that the Bible doesn't name this nearer kinsman by name. And I took away from that is when we do, not, not that it's about us, not that it's about our name, uh, but when we do what God calls us to do, when we do what God wants from us, uh, he'll use us. And we see here, uh, just jumping ahead, uh, Ruth in the, and Boaz in the lineage of Jesus and, and all these others in the lineage of Jesus. They gave them a name. Uh, but this guy didn't do what he was supposed to do. And he's left nameless in the Bible. So he kind of missed his blessing uh, because he didn't do what he was supposed to do. Also wrote down here, uh, there was 10 witnesses. It says there were... Um, there were uh, in Jewish tradition, witnesses were used as a way of considering an agreement or settlement binding. In weightier matters, you know, it says where I believe in one place it talks about having two two witnesses uh, to witness to the same thing would make something true in Jewish tradition. But having weightier matters such as matrimony being one, ten was a common number. Uh, and then, you know, there in verse 2, it says he took 10 men of the elders of the city. So this was something that was kind of uh, making this binding, making this for real, making this uh, final decision uh, for, for the situation here. 
Uh, getting back in the scripture, verse 3, it says, And he said to the kinsman, uh, And he said to the kinsman, Naomi, that is come out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elder of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, this being the nearer kinsman, and he said, I will redeem it. So Boaz has identified this individual as the nearest kinsman. He told him Naomi's situation. The kinsman agrees he will be the redeemer. He agrees that he will do, uh, according to the law, um, the, the duty of the nearest kinsman. Uh, but Boaz has left out one little piece. So let's, let's go a little bit further. In verse 5 it says, Then Boaz said, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must also thou, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up a name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. So the kinsman was all game up front. He was like, yeah, I'll redeem it. Uh, I'll, I'll take on, you know, the, the land, because that's what he, he first mentions is, is uh, redeeming Naomi's um, land that was, so there was something in it for him. Uh, but when Boaz goes on to say, okay, now there's also Ruth, uh, who, according to the law, when you redeem, you're going to bring up an inheritance, um, uh, um, a child to her for an inheritance so that the, the name's not cut off and, and the, the, the kinsman backs up and it's kind of like he, he crab walks out of the situation. He's like, yeah, I'll do this. Then when he hears the extra of what I call baggage, he's like, oh, I don't think so. Um, and it, it got me to thinking um, about two things. One, are we willing to sacrifice self for the betterment of others? Uh, here, the nearer kinsman hears that there's a sacrifice of himself that he's going to make. He says, lest I mar my inheritance. Uh, are we willing to sacrifice some personal things to reach somebody else or to help somebody else? Will we go the extra mile to reach a lost soul? It's going to be hard. It may require a little bit of work. Are we willing to do that? Will we give up what we want to see others? Uh, will we give up what we want to see others get what they need? Uh, it's just human nature. We're we're selfish at times, and there's things that we want, and there's things that we could have uh, if we put self first. Uh, but it's not about us. It's about advancing. Uh, the kingdom. It's about witnessing to others. It's about seeing that lost soul come in. And are we willing to give up some of the things that we want in our life? Are we willing to give up an extra hour or two sleep on Sunday morning to go out maybe early and compel others to come to church with us? Are we willing to give up uh, weeknights to go out and witness? Are we willing, whatever it might be, for others for the sake of others. So the first thing to think about is that I thought about um, was are we willing to sacrifice self for the betterment, betterment of others? The second thing, and I really like this one, um, we talked, uh, I said, it seems kind of like the nearer kinsman was all in until he realized there was some baggage that came along with it. Uh, Naomi had some baggage. Ruth had some baggage. Christ saw my baggage Yet he went all the way to the cross for me. I was not perfect. I was not worthy. I was not. I was not um, uh, worth. And none of us were. Where the Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rags. We weren't deserving of the gift of salvation. We weren't deserving of God coming down in the form of man and living a perfect life and dying on the cross for us. But he saw our baggage and was still willing. Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly.
For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Listen to this. This is where God saw our baggage and took it on anyway. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just like, it's, it's almost like a foreshadowing, but Boaz knew that there was some baggage by taking on this kinsman role. There was some things he was going to have to do. Uh, it might make his name a little less esteemed in Israel. It might cost him a little in his field. It might, all these things that it could do, but he was willing for Ruth. Jesus was willing to go all the way to the cross, die cruel death for you and I um, who were not worthy of any of this. Um, jumping ahead back into the scripture, uh, Ruth chapter 4 verse 7 says, Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning uh, charging for to confirm all things. A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, I have purchased. All caps. I, I put that in all, well, bold. Uh, stands out. I have purchased. This is Boaz saying, I have purchased Ruth to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Your witnesses this day. And, and my note here is how does Boaz's words in verse 10 relate to our salvation through Christ? Now I'm going to read verse 10 again, and I'm going to try to emphasize the words that I bolded here because I think these are important and fit. It, Like I said, I, it, it's somewhat like the story of Boaz and Ruth is a microcosm story of Jesus and the plan of salvation for all of us. Uh, we were all in need of the nearer kinsman. We were all in need of the Redeemer to come and, and, and redeem us. That our name, be, well, I'm getting ahead. Uh, uh, let me read verse 10 again, then I'll go through my notes. It says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up a name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place, your witnesses this day. Number one, we're purchased. Uh, Jesus, Jesus gave the ultimate sacrifice, paid the ultimate cost, the only thing that could purchase us was the blood of Jesus. It was, it's not our works. It's not our uh, want to. It's not our money. It's not. It takes being purchased, blood bought, uh, because of our sins. There was a price to pay. We, our soul was not free. Uh, our soul cost the ultimate price, which was the death of. The, the, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, to purchase our soul, to bring us, to redeem us from what was lost. To be redeemed to mean you once had it. Okay, going back to the Garden of Eden, there was a fall in the garden. Ever since the fall, all men are born into a sinful, fallen nature, and we are being redeemed. We are being rebought. We are being reestablished to have the relationship that man and God were created by God to have that relationship. But it came with a cost, and that cost was the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And without that cost, we can't be purchased. We can't be redeemed. We can't come to him except through the blood of, of Jesus. 
first uh corinthians 6 and 20 just the first part of that verse it even says for ye are bought with a price what was the price the blood it goes all the way back to the passover it took the blood of a lamb uh the passover there, there was uh the lord told moses and moses told the israelites look the death angel is going to come through He's going to look for the blood. If the blood's not applied to the lintel and the doorpost, and, and now in our life, the lintel and the doorpost being the, the, the heart of man, if it's not applied when the death angel comes by, death, the second death for us, I'm trying to relate the two together here, but for us, second death, which is hell, which is eternal separation from God, which is the opposite of, of being redeemed and reestablished in that perfect perfect union, without the blood, without the the accepting the price that was paid, that's what we get. So it goes all the way back to the Passover. But after the first Passover and the giving of the law, there had to be continual sacrifices made of a lamb without blemish. It couldn't just be, oh, I'm going to go out here in the flock and get whichever lamb I find, or hey, there's a weak one over there. Or hey, let's let's you know this lamb that let's go get the run. It had to be perfect. That it was a sacrifice, just like Ruth uh, or Boaz taking on this. The the nearer kinsman didn't want to take it on because it was going to cost him something. Imagine you have this flock of lambs and you have to go get the best and give it up. Okay, that's what what had to be done annually, routinely for the covering of sins, but. The blood of animals couldn't permanently pay the price for our sin. So God sent the true perfect lamb. John said when he saw him, he said, Behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The perfect lamb to come uh, without blemish, lived a life sin free, gave his life. No one took it from him. He gave his life to pay that price that our sin had put on us to put us in bondage, to put us in chains. He came to break the bonds. He came to break the chains. He came to redeem, repurchase that that was already his, that we through sin had been separated and to bring a, a bridge uh, between us and God to cover a gap that we couldn't get across on our own. It was through him. It was through that perfect uh, lamb, through that sacrifice. Only Jesus could serve as our perfect lamb that would never need to be sacrificed again. Look at Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24 through 28. It says, But this man, being Jesus, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. He's able to save us to the uttermost. There's no more that needs to be done. There's no, okay, you've got him. Now you got a, like a, a computer. You get a computer and every so many, it seems like every day, but every so often you have to update it. Windows needs an update. You need the, the newest model. Uh, you have a car and it gets wore out and you need a newer car. No, 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 no. Jesus, the price that he paid, his blood, uh, was able to save them to the utmost that come, or uttermost, that come unto God by him. Seeing he liveth to make intercession for them. That's what Jesus does. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, constantly making intercession for you and I. He is our bridge on that gap that, that canyon that we can't cross from us to God. It takes him. Um, it's going on this in Hebrews. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Perfect lamb, without spot, without blemish. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the ones of the people. The priest had to offer up sacrifices not just for the people of Israel. They, they weren't perfect. They had to offer up their own sacrifices for their self. But Jesus came, lived that perfect life, gave the perfect sacrifice for us that it never had to be done again. Um, 
once you're there, it doesn't have to, you don't get saved every other Sunday. It doesn't work that way. Uh, let's see, who uh, needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself, Jesus on the cross. He did it once. He didn't have to do it again. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Jesus' words on the cross, it is is finished. The plan of salvation, it's finished. The price to be paid for you and I, it's finished. There's nothing that needs to be updated in 2021. There's no vaccine we need to take that 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 boosts our salvation. There's no government individual that comes along that strengthens our salvation. It was finished on the cross. The price was paid. It's done. We have to accept it. Now, he's not going to force it on us, but the price has been paid. We just have to accept it. There's nothing else to be done. That, that's, that's, that's where we're at here. Uh, now, let's back up and see. Let's get tie this back into Ruth one more time. Uh, what Boaz had done for Ruth and that she was purchased, he, pur he said, I have purchased, uh, have I purchased to be my wife? He purchased Ruth, it cost him something. Uh, Boaz purchased her. He redeemed her. He reestablished Ruth. He reestablished Naomi. He reestablished the name, Elimelech's name, through Israel that it wouldn't be cut off from the people. And he sat her on the path. There's a, there's a path that goes through this, too. Uh, when we look at the... Um, genealogy and the lineage of Jesus. So Boaz had purchased Ruth. He, he had redeemed her. He had reestablished re her. He had set her back on the path. Uh, it's a picture of what Jesus has done for each and every one of us through his work. Uh, we've been purchased. Uh, we were bought with a price. We've been redeemed. We've been reestablished to have that relationship, uh, not that religion, that relationship with the Lord that was the intentions from in the beginning, when you read Genesis, in the beginning, there was intentions for God and man to have a relationship. Genesis says nothing about a religion, a relationship. We've had that reestablished through the work of Christ on the cross. We've been set back on the path that sin had taken us off of. We were born in sin, we were born heading down a path, and, and, and we come to this age of account, we're, we're heading down a path, and at some point we come to an age of accountability where we come to a crossroads, and there's this way, and there's this way, and if we don't choose the Lord, we're going down this path that's not the path that we're supposed to be on, but when we choose Him, when we, when we accept what He's done, He establishes that path. And he will stay with us on that path. And when the valley comes, he will carry us through the valley. When the mountains come, he will help us climb the mountain. When we're at the mountain top, he will look down in joy with us at our at our joy. When when we joy when we're, we're happy, the Lord's happy. When we're sad, the Lord's sad. When we hurt, he hurts for us. He's been through all these. He's there for us. He's on this path with us. When we can't walk, he will carry us. When we can't see the the pitfalls and the, the the maybe the root that's sticking up that we're going to trip over, he knows what's on our path. He's he's established our path, and he's not going to set us on our path after we're. He's not going to put you on the path to 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 heaven, and it's like okay, here's salvation, here's heaven. Okay, I've got you right here on the path. Find your way to here. He's with us all the way, all the way, even until the end. So uh, here it says, I put, if it weren't for Boaz, Ruth would have had no hope. Ruth had lost her husband. Ruth had lost her brother-in-law. Naomi had lost her husband. Naomi was going back to her people. Ruth saw something in Naomi 
Might not have understood it, but saw something in Naomi through all this that made her stick to Naomi and go back with Naomi. Through those choices, Ruth ends up there with Boaz, and there's still a choice to make. She didn't have to listen to Naomi and go into Boaz's field. At any time, she could have decided to walk out of Boaz's field and go to any other field and try to glean, but yet she stayed in the field of Boaz. She's explained who she is and how she's related to Boaz, and, and Boaz understands the redeeming nature of their kinship. Through all this, Ruth is purchased. Ruth is redeemed. Ruth is reestablished. Ruth is set back on the path. Without Boaz, Ruth had no hope. Ruth would have been back in Moab, who knows what. That's the same as us. If it weren't for Jesus, we would have no hope. We have no hope of salvation. We can't save ourselves. Our works can't get us to heaven. Our money can't get us to heaven. Uh, my, my stunning good looks can't get me to heaven. None of these things can get us to heaven. Without Jesus, there is no hope of reconciliation and redeeming. Uh, we are a sinful creature bound for hell without, without him. So, so there is, in my opinion, some, some foreshadow or some correlation here of the story of Boaz and Ruth to the relationship of us and Christ. If we read it and we study it deep enough and apply it, we're all a Ruth. Jesus is our Boaz. He's our protector. He's our redeemer. He's our, he's our um, identity. He's our everything. Uh, just as Boaz was for Ruth, that's what Jesus is for us. Um, moving right along, chapter or chapter, uh, chapter four, verse eleven. It says, "And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that has come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did uh, build the house of Israel, and do thou worthily in Ephrata." and be famous in Bethlehem. I want to stop there because that is, because we're, we're getting close to the end with the lineage of Christ, or, or it doesn't go that far here, but the lineage of Ruth. Uh, it says, be famous in Ephrata, uh, or be worthily, do it worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Bethlehem. Well, that's, that's to some foreshadowing. Micah 5 and 2. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, Though thou be little among thousands of Judah, yet out of thee, uh, or yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been told from old, from everlasting. It's prophecy that from Bethlehem, Ephrata, that's where Jesus is going to be born. That's where he's going to come from. Uh, it goes all the way back to Ruth. Uh, Ruth wasn't anything special. Ruth wasn't any one of power or or of authority Ruth wasn't noble of of great or of great bloodline but Ruth was humble and willing and that also ties to us because we don't have to be anything special we don't have to have any certain power of authority uh, we don't have to be a noble or of a certain name or a bloodline my, my last name um, isn't something special. Um, people may hear Mallet and know some Mallets. Uh, people may hear your last name and know some of your kinfolk, and, and it may be one of those uh, where your last name might not carry positive um, things. It may, it may be like, oh Lord, here comes one of them. I, my kids, you know, growing up um, are going, teachers or people are going to hear, oh, you're, you're one of them Mallets. Oh Lord, are you like your daddy? Uh, but but it's nothing special. Ruth was nothing special. She was just humble and she was willing to do what she was supposed to do. You don't have to be a great something. You don't have to be a great to do person to be used by God. All you have to be is willing. You don't have to have, uh, Paul even said, he didn't come with fancy words. Um, I, I, I feel like I'm probably the worst preacher anybody's ever sat under and listened. Um, I don't know how to teach. I don't like to talk. Um, I feel most comfortable doing this because it's just me and my phone in here. I don't see all y'all 
or any of y'all that are watching. Um, I'm not, I don't have any fancy words to say. Uh, but if I will let God use me, and if you will let God use you, he'll give you the words. All he needs is the mouthpiece. Uh, he don't really need me. If I'm not willing, he'll find somebody else that is. His word's going to go out. His, his mission's going to be accomplished. But God just wants us to be willing. Willing to stand up and, and, and say we love the Lord. Willing to raise a hand. Willing to be whatever it is, that key that, that's been preached about in our church for a while now, that key to the service, uh, that key to somebody else's salvation. We have to be willing to be used by God because it's not about us. It's about the lost. It's about reaching that one more person. And we have to be humble. We have to be willing. Uh, back into the scripture, pick it up in Ruth 4 and 12. It says, And let thy house be like the house of Phares, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife, and he went in unto her, but, and when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. Uh, the Lord's name may be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of, their, of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. Again, um, I personally see in this, this, this verse, <clears throat> or these verses, foreshadowings of Jesus. How? Well, look at verse 15. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. Because we were born into a sinful, fallen world, the process of death begins at birth. There's a, there's a song. Um, the kids know which song I'm talking about. It, it's, it's, not a, it's not a Christian song. It's a, um, it's a um, secular song, but, but I always like the song. and It's got a line that's always stuck out to me, even before I was saved and in church. This line, for some reason, always stuck out to me. And it says, as soon as you're born, you start dying. And that's the truth. We're born in sin. The, the process of death in our life begins the second we are born. Because sin is, is rooted in human life. But because uh, of the death, because of the, the blood that was shed, because of the resurrection, the Lord has become the restorer of our life. We don't, and what do you mean the restorer of our life? Yeah, we're all going to die. Uh, if the Lord tarries his coming, we will all see death. It says it's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Uh, that's the first death. What people fail, and, and, and I think we fail to realize, is there's a second death. Second death being eternal death, eternal separation from God, eternal damnation in hell. That's the second death, but we don't have to experience that because God has come and paid the price to restore our eternal life. Dying without Jesus is eternal death, but accepting his gift of salvation is a restoration of eternal life. We, we're going to physically die. We were not meant to live on this world, on this earth, forever. We are meant to live in his presence forever. Uh, whether or not we accept the, the price that's been paid is on you and I. But there is a second death. There is a way to avoid the second death. There is a restoration of life beyond death but only through Jesus Christ. Um, back into the verses. Verse 16 says, And Naomi took the child and lay it in her bosom and became nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. 
He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Okay, so because of Ruth's faithfulness, she became a link in the genealogy of Jesus because we know Jesus came from the lineage of David. Well, here we're going back to David's grandfather, Obed, is the son of Ruth. Not because she was special, but because she was willing and obedient. God can use us. God still uses people. Just like, it's not just an Old Testament story. It's not just before the birth of Christ that God used people. It's not just with the 12 disciples where God used people. It's not just with Paul where God used people to, 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 to spread his word out. It's not just with the apostles or, or with uh, John or with um, the author of Hebrews or, or oh, good grief, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. But it's not just with those. It didn't, when that last book of the Bible was written and that last person of the, the old time, I guess, so to say, the, the apostle, the last true apostle died, God didn't stop using people. He still uses people today. But do we have that same willingness to be used as they were? Use me, Lord, in whatever way you see fit for your kingdom. Um, we have to be willing, we have to be obedient, and God will use you. Okay, now we're going to finish out um, the book of Ruth. Uh, the last five verses here. Verse 18, it says, Now these are the generations of Phares. Phares begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Amenadab, and Amenadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Uh, so it starts the lineage, which ends at David right there, but this picks back up uh, in Matthew. If you flip over to the first uh, chapter of Matthew and start reading, you'll see this lineage, and you'll see it finished out all the way to Christ. Uh, trivia, who was Boaz's mother? Okay, It says, Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz. Well, when you get over to Matthew, look at Matthew 1 and 5. Salmon begat Boaz of Rahab. Hey, we just said all you got to do is be willing and obedient. Ruth was willing to be. She wasn't an Israelite. She was a Moabite. But she was willing to let God use her. Okay, well, who is Rahab? Do y'all remember who Rahab is? Go look in Joshua. Rahab not only was not an Israelite, Rahab was from Jericho. She was a Canaanite. Rahab, Rahab was a harlot. But when the two spies came, Rahab was obedient. Rahab did what God wanted Rahab to do, and she finished it out, too, because she could have hid the spies and sent them away, and that been it. But she listened to what the spies said to do, because had she not done what they told her to do, when they did come and defeat Jericho, she and her family would have died with everybody else. But she listened she applied what they said. They said, you know, if you're found in this house, if you put this uh, scarlet rope from your window, we will pass by you. Scarlet. There you go. Blood of a lamb in the Passover. The scarlet rope. It takes the blood. If you apply this blood to your life, we will pass over you. We will see that you're taken care of, Rahab. We will, and, and where does Rahab end up of all places in the lineage of Jesus Christ? What can we be if we let God use us? Remember, God can use anybody despite their past. We just have to be willing to be used however he sees fit. It might not be what we want to do. It might not be how we see fit. It might not be glorious and glamorous. I'm not going to be... Uh, mainly because he was born before me, but I'm not going to be written down as Jeremy, the father of this one, begat this one, begat this one, through to Jesus Christ. But through my willingness, through my obedience, what can be accomplished down the road in my children's life, in my children's children's life, in my great-great-great-great-grandkids' life, in the person that they work with, it just it, it, it snowball effects. What we do today for God, 
what we seeds we plant today we may never see come to fruition in our lifetime but that doesn't mean that God isn't working and that doesn't mean that God isn't using it uh, I'm sure Ruth never thought the Savior of the world is going to come through through my family Rahab never thought the Savior of the world is going to come through my family no I don't Mary when, when the angel came to Mary, Mary was like, whoa, 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 whoa. And this is just me speaking. Whoa, whoa, what, what do you mean I'm fixing to have a baby and it's going to be the, the, the son of God and it's going to be the savior of the world? Who would have ever woke up one day and imagined that? But Mary was willing to do, Mary was willing to go through, okay, Mary was young, I think probably about 13, 14, if, if I understand right. At the time of the conception of, she was a young girl, a, a kid in our eyes today. Um, could you imagine, because times then and times now are a lot different, but especially back then, the ridicule, the, the, the people making fun of her, probably she was shunned because she was so young and pregnant and, and she was young and, and not even married to Joseph yet. I mean, that was grounds probably for, for you could kill her and it'd be okay. But Mary knew that it was something greater than her. The, the, the whole point was not about Mary. And she was willing to take on the ridicule. She was willing to be shunned. She was willing to be looked down upon in the eyes of other Israelites. You're not going to be esteemed for being a Christian, for doing what God tells you to do, for, for taking the stands you take are not going to be popular. The walk you walk is not going to be the walk other people are going to say, oh, look at him. He's, that's awesome. Uh, that's, not, that's not the case. You're going to be made fun of. You're going to be ridiculed. You're going to be all these things. Uh, Jesus said, they did it to me. If they do it to me, what makes you think they're not going to do it to you? Okay. But it's worth it in the end. Uh, it's worth the, the, the sacrifice here is well worth the price because we can't pay it. It's worth, there's nothing we can do to repay the Lord for the price that he's paid for our soul. The least we can do is be a humble, willing vessel for him to use. Um, and I hope that some of you have enjoyed this. This is the end of, of um, Ruth. I hope you've got something out of it. I've enjoyed it. Um, I've, I've always liked Ruth. Every time I go through it, I find something new. It encourages me. I hope it's been an encouragement to you. I'm not really sure what's next on my plate. Uh, something will be. God will show me. Uh, we'll do something um, next at some point. Um, and I pray that, that God can use it, if, if nothing more than to encourage me if nothing more than to let me grow closer to him or learn more about him. But I, I pray that it's been something to, to you all. I pray that you've got something out of it. Um, if, if not, I, I do encourage you to go all the way through Ruth. It's a short book. If, if I had started in chapter one, verse one, and just read through, we could have, and, and I didn't talk, we could have read Ruth through in 30 minutes. It's a short book. I encourage you to go back to the beginning and read through Ruth for yourself. Ask God what he wants you to see through Ruth. And 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 put yourself in those positions. Put yourself in that, how does this apply to me today in 2021? Because the entire Bible from, from in the beginning to amen is applied daily to us. Uh, so uh, I encourage you to study. I encourage you to know it for yourself. I encourage you to dig in and see what God wants to show you. He wants to show us all. You'll see something different than I see. I'll see something different than you see. He, he wants, like we say, not that religion. He wants that relationship. And the only way to build a relationship is to have that conversation. The only way to have that conversation is through prayer and studying the Word, reading the Word, praying, asking, seeking, uh, seeking, and he'll open up to you and he'll show you what he wants you to know. But we have to put forth the effort. We have to be willing. We have to be obedient. So I've enjoyed our time together. Uh, I've enjoyed the times Ashley set in with me. Um, 
I've enjoyed y'all's comments. I appreciate all y'all that have encouraged me to continue on because I will, I'll be the first to say it's even today, um, it's, it's one of those, I, I set a date and I push it and I set a date and I push it. And then when it's, I, I, the devil knows how to work on me and get me discouraged. The devil knows how to make me want to say, well, you can do that tomorrow. But I, I appreciate the encouragement of those around me who said, when are we going to do this? When are you going to say that or, or read this part? Um, I appreciate that. I need, I personally need that. I need that accountability. Um, and I appreciate it. So I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Um, study up, because who knows where we might go next. Um, but we there will be a next, and we'll see where that is. So I love you all. Go to church somewhere on Sunday. If you don't have a church to go to, come to New Beginning at 10 o'clock in Atala. We'd love to have you. We'll try not to cough on you, or, or uh, we'll social distance hug from the front row to the back row all that good stuff, uh, but, but find yourself in a church, find yourself in God's Word, and be willing, obedient, and humble, and let's, uh, let's, there's still work to be done. If there weren't, God would have already sent His Son back, so there's still work to be done. So let's make sure we're in the fields uh, laboring, because the day is going to come where there is no more time to work. Uh, but while it's day, let's get the work done, so. Love y'all.